Chapter 4, Measures of Veritability, Part 1. The learning outcomes or learning objectives for this chapter are as follows. When we're done with this chapter, we'll understand the purpose of measuring veritability. The word veritability should convey an idea of consistency um, or how similar scores are to one another and more importantly, how similar scores are to the mean of the distribution. Keep in mind that the measures of central tendency, the mean in particular, its purpose is to represent all scores. So measures of variability are going to help us assess how well the mean of a distribution represents all the scores in that distribution. We'll learn to define the range. Uh, you can think of the range as the span of scores. Um, in other words, how many scores are being um, displayed in distribution. We'll learn how to compute the range. We'll understand variance and standard deviation. Briefly, variance is the average of squared deviations, and standard deviation is the average deviation between scores and the mean of a distribution. And as I've indicated in previous lectures, the standard deviation of distribution is the most important statistic that you will learn in this course. It's applicable to many um, subsequent statistical procedures. So your understanding not only of the computation of how to derive standard deviation is important, the definition of that concept is essential. We'll learn how to calculate SS. SS stands for the sum of squared deviations, as well as calculate variance and standard deviation of a population. And we'll do the similar calculations for a sample, and we'll see how they differ from one another. Again, as um, presented in previous chapters, things that we will need to Master before we can move on. Again, the summation notation, so sigma, becomes very important um, and most likely we'll be summing x values and we'll also become familiar with this notation, the sum of an x value minus the mean of a distribution in addition to the sum of an x value minus the mean squared. So all of these things will be discussed in this chapter. Additionally, we should um, have mastered the concepts of the mean um, of a distribution and the median, so those two important measures of central tendency. Notice the mode is not necessarily um, as important and illustrated here. It's not listed. It is important to know what the mode represents, but in terms of our calculations from this point forward, it is not um, something that we'll use readily. Um, because mode is not applicable to quantitative data. A quick overview. Ver variability can be defined several ways. Um, a quant it could be considered as a quantitative distance measured based on the difference between scores. It could also be thought of as, as it describes a distance of the spread of scores or distance of a score from the mean. The definition I like to provide is um, the variation or consistency of scores, consistency or inconsistency of scores. Um, and the purpose of measures of variability is to describe the distribution. Again, Chapter 1 presented the ideas of descriptive and inferential statistics. We are still under the umbrella of descriptive. We started in Chapter 2 by organizing um, information. Chapter 3 measures the central tendency. That was um, the process of summarizing information. And in addition to the measure of central tendency, we also will see um, that measures of variability will coincide with the mean or be reported with the mean to give us a better sense of that distribution. So again, the mean is um, one data point that represents all. The standard deviation is going to help us understand how well that mean represents all the scores. So again, the purpose of measures of variability is to describe the distribution, measure how well an individual score represents the distribution, in particular how well the mean of that distribution represents all the scores just briefly, uh, what, what we're going to be able to assess is are all the scores very, um, very similar to the mean or are they very different from the mean?
So here's a visual uh, um, interpretation of what I just indicated. We have two distributions here. We have adult heights in inches and adult weights in pounds. If I were to ask you which distribution is more varied or has greater variation, which would you um, select? The adult heights or adult weights? Which distribution is more varied? And you should answer that weight is more varied, and, and we can see this by the spread of weights versus the spread of heights. And we would understand biologically adult, um, adults in our society, their heights aren't going to vary um, significantly. It's determined by biology. But um, weight, on the other hand, is determined by biology and environment, what we eat. And in our society, we see that there's great variation. So in the center, the mean height here in this distribution is expressed as 70 inches. And here we have an average weight of 170 in pounds. And what we're showing is that the span of weight um, runs from 110 pounds all the way to 230. Great variation from the center of 170. Whereas when we talk about height, again, there are two different scales of measurement, inches versus pounds, but nonetheless, we can still see that there's great variation. That the spread of scores ranges from 82 to 58 inches. There's a lot less um, variation in height opposed to weight. So when you see a visual like this, when there's a greater peak um, illustrated, that means that the scores are more tightly centered around the mean. And we can interpret that as the mean is a good representation of all the scores in the distribution. When it's flatter, as we see in the example with weight, we see that the scores are very inconsistent and they're not tightly centered around the mean, the center of the distribution. They're more spread out and we have a greater variation or variance or standard deviation is larger. Um, so again, what we are hoping for as researchers, this will come into play a lot in this um, class, is that initially we hope that our distributions are consistent, meaning that we have low variability so that when we compare something, let's say um, the independent variable is the dosage of an antidepressant. So let's just take for consideration, we assess level of depression for a group of depressed individuals and it looks like this. And then we expose them, um, and let's say we're talking about the average episodes of depression. And before they receive the drug, they have an average of 30 episodes of depression. And then we um, give them the drug for, let's say, 60 days, and we see that the variation still doesn't change, but it decreases to an average of 10 episodes of depression. Now, when we have consistent distributions, it's easier to see a change um, in values. If we were to plot this one on top of the other, we would say here now this is the new distribution. We can see that the drug was somewhat effective. Whether it was statistically significantly effective is to, to be determined by a statistical test. But um, what I'm trying to convey here is that when we have consistency in scores, it's easier to see differences that are um, as a result of the independent variable or as a result of the creation of groups based on a quasi-independent variable. And this will become a lot more um, evident as we move into inferential statistics. But just visually, if I could um, contrast that with if our original distribution looked something like this and they had an average um, number of depression episodes of 30, and after treatment, it still moved down to 10, as I had indicated. 10, it's much harder to determine that the change was due to treatment versus the, the change is simply due to chance that we collected a sample that tended to be on the lower end of the depression scale. So we'll talk more about this, but I just want to introduce this concept of
Low variability helps us better assess change due to the independent variable or due to the quasi-independent variable. When we have greater variation, it's, it's harder to detect differences um, due to the manipulation of the independent variable or the creation of groups based on the quasi-independent variable. There are three measures of variability. They include the range, which is simply the span of scores, the variance, which is the average of squared deviations, and the standard deviation, which represents the actual average um, difference between scores and the mean of a distribution. The range, it's the first and um, quickest assessment of variability that we can apply. It simply represents the distance that's covered um, by the scores in a distribution. Again, the span of scores from the smallest value to the highest value. Um, for continuous data, real limits are used, so we would use um, this equation. Range is equal to URL, which is upper real limit for the highest. X max is the highest value, minus the lower real limit for the lowest score, X minimum. Um, for discrete variables, we can just use range is equal to high score minus the low score. Um, the text also talks about this possible equation of high score minus low score plus one. And either is fine. Um, the difference is just considering how many actual values are in the range. Um, and it, it's splitting hairs and we're not going to focus on um, you know, whether one is right or wrong. They're both applicable. Um, and the reason we don't focus too much on the differences is because the range is not as um, great or efficient in illustrating variability. And the reason is, is because it's based on two scores only. It's not based on, on, on the entire data. So it's pretty unreliable and um, unpredictable because, and it, the range is extremely and adversely affected by extreme scores. So just um, in a quick example, if we had a distribution of scores that look like this, let's say um, 2, 4, 6, and 40, right? And we wanted to express the span of scores. Well, we would have to take um, 40 minus 2 to get 38, and that would illustrate the span of scores. But that kind of conveys that the distribution is very inconsistent, that the scores are really spread out from one another. When in fact, the scores are pretty similar. The first three scores only deviate by two points. It's the deviation here that increases um, the deviation demonstrated for the entire distribution. So the range is flawed in the sense that it relies only on two scores. So the difference between the high score and the low score. And if we have extreme scores on either end, it's going to um, be a misrepresentation of the span of the entire set of scores or the representation of variability. Standard deviation variance for a population. So the most common and most important measure of variability is the standard deviation. I can't stress that enough. So we need to master not only the definition, but the ca um, calculation of standard deviation for a sample and population to be successful in this class because so many statistical procedures rely on that statistic. It is a measure of um, standard or average. Whenever you see the word standard, you can replace it with the word average. So it's the distance from the mean. So as I indicated earlier, a simple definition of standard deviation is the average difference or distance between scores in the distribution, x values, and the mean of the distribution. So we'll recognize that each score is different from the mean a certain amount. And what standard deviation represents is the average difference. You can consider the example of age. We have an average age in this class. Let's say the average age is equal to 21. That tells us it's a good summary of everyone's age, but is everyone 21 in this class? Most likely not. Um, so we ha may have one student whose age is 19, and we have another student that's aged 26. So we know that there's deviation or difference between each person's age and the average age. 
and um, in the first case, the first student deviates um, from 21 by two years. Um, so their deviation score would be two years. The other student deviates by five years. And so what we are calculating is taking everyone's deviation, averaging it to get a sense of how well the average age of 21 represents everyone to everyone's age in the class. <clears throat> so it does, it describes whether the scores are clustered closely around the mean, think of that distribution of the adult heights, or widely scattered um, from the mean, think of the visual for the average weight of adults. So the calculation differs for population and samples, and we'll go into depth um, for each of those calculations in just a moment. Variance is a necessary companion concept to standard deviation, but not the same concept. So again, what I indicated earlier, variance is the average of squared deviations. Standard deviation is just the average of the deviation. So we need to calculate variance first before we can um, arrive at the standard deviation. So that's why it says it's a necessary concept, um, but it's not the same. So here's a step-by-step -step process with defining the standard deviation. Step one, determine the deviation. So when I say deviation, you should understand that that conveys um, the idea of something being different from the norm. So if someone were to say you're a deviant in society, what they're indicating is that you're different from the average person. And we recognize that being a deviant in society is not always a negative thing. If we didn't have deviants in society, people like Rosa Parks, who um, was one of the influential members of, of um, the civil rights movement, um, things in our society would not have changed in terms of race relations. So just recognize that deviant um, or deviation means different from the norm. In statistical concepts, the mean represents the norm. The mean is the average, the, the um, expected um, value from a distribution. We calculate deviation by taking any score in the distribution and subtracting the mean. So again, we need to recognize that we have to utilize our understanding of how to calculate the mean of a distribution, which is simply taking the average or the sum, excuse me, the sum of scores and dividing by how many scores we have if we're talking about a population. Step two, find the sum of deviations to use as a basis of finding an average deviation. We know how to calculate an average, right? It's always the sum of what we're talking about divided by how many we have. Um, but there is a problem that arises when we're simply trying to take the average of deviations. Um, the deviation sum to zero because the mean is the balance point. If the sum always is zero, the mean deviation will always be zero. So technically we're going to need another strategy to find the average. But before I go any further, let me show you what I mean by the average deviation always equaling zero using the balance point um, slide that I presented in the previous chapter. All right, so this slide is from chapter three, the balance point, where we understood that the average, the center is the balance point, and we have equal distance above and equal distance below. So if we were to calculate, calculate the deviation for every score, so our score of 10, so I have a, my scores listed here on the left, and then this, this calculation of x minus the mu. We calculated the mu in the previous lecture. So we would take 10 minus 5, and that gives us 5. 6 minus 5 is 1. 6 minus 5 is 1. 2 minus 5 is negative 3. And 4 minus 5 is negative 4. So if we were to add all of this up, take the sum of our x values minus the mean, right, which is the sum of all deviations, that would equal, if we add this up, 5 plus 1, 6, 7, that's positive 7, and then added to negative 7, right, negative 3 plus negative 4, we get 0. And that tells us nothing, and it doesn't um, give us a sense of what the average difference is. Again, this represents all the individual differences or deviations for each score. But if we take the sum, and again, our understanding of 
the average of something is the sum of what we're working with over n. So in this case, we're trying to calculate the average of the deviations, but every time we take the summation of deviations, regardless of what distribution we're working with, the sum of deviations will always equal zero because of this concept of the balance point. Remember, in this case, we had seven points above, seven points below, and summing those up will always equal zero. So that poses a barrier to calculating the average. So we're going to learn about how to address that barrier. So our solution, our revised step two, indicates that we need to remove the negative deviations um, because again the positive distance minus the negative distance always equals zero. So first we're going to square each deviation score and then we'll take the sum of squared deviations. So what we'll see is sigma, the sum of our deviation values squared and that'll lead to this new statistic um, that we're learning about called variance. So step three we're going to be able to calculate the average of the square deviations. So the mean square deviation is known as the variance. Variability is now measured in squared units because of this fact that we needed to do away with those um, negative values that were canceling out the positive values. So we're squaring those deviations. And again, variability and standard deviation are both averages. But now we recognize that because we've squared deviations, the population variance equals the average squared deviation or distance of the scores for the population mean. So uh, mathematically, it's a great solution. We've been able to come up with a value that doesn't cancel each other out or equals zero. But now we have the predicament that the, this statistic, the variance, is reported in squared units. Um, if I were to ask someone what um, the distance from here to Los Angeles, um, most likely I'm not hoping someone reports that distance in squared miles. Um, I would prefer to know exactly how far it is in miles. So our, our um, goal is to report the average distance in original units. So step four. The goal is to compute a measure of standard or average distance of the scores from the mean. The variance measures the average square distance um, from the mean. So it's not quite our goal and um, presents yet another um, bump in the road, um, but our solution is to adjust for this and we adjust for having squared all the differences by taking the square root of the variance. So it's a very simple solution. The standard deviation is therefore equal to the square root of our variance. Once we take the square root of our variance, which is the average of squared mean deviations, we will have brought the statistic back into its original units and it will express the average distance of scores from the mean. Again, the word average can always be replaced with the word standard. It's a synonym when we're talking about statistics. So here is a quick diagram of what we just discussed. So <clears throat> our interest is to find the average distance between scores and the mean of a distribution. So to begin that process, we would find the deviation. So again, we just learned that deviation is equal to so deviation is equal to the score, any score, minus the mean of the distribution. Now if we were to add all of those deviations, right, if we took the sum of all scores minus the mean. If we take the sum, that's always going to equal zero, and that poses a, a, a dead end. So our solution is to square each of those deviations. So we're going to take this a score minus the mean, and we're going to square it. And in order to find the average of those squared deviations, um, we recognize this new statistic. It's sum of squared deviations. So we're going to take the sum of all those squared deviations, right? Um, and then that's going to allow us to calculate the average. And that average of squared deviations is called the variance. And the variance is equal to the sum of squared deviations over our population size.
And then finally, recognizing that that's reported in squared units, we want to bring um, that back into original units, and that's going to lead to our standard deviation, which is equal to the square root of our variance. So these, these are the steps that we need to follow. Conceptually, what we want to find out is the average deviation. So mathematically, this is the procedure that we would um, engage in to finally report the standard deviation, the average difference between the scores and the mean of a distribution. Figure 4.3 demonstrates um, an example in your text on page 95, it's example 4.2 where they calculate the actual standard deviation for this distribution of five scores. And the average of this distribution is equal to six. And they calculate the standard deviation to equal 2.83. This is the notation for standard deviation, it's lowercase Greek sigma. But, um, and I encourage you to walk through that example again, it's at example 4.2, I'm not going to go through all of that, but what I do want to point out is we can um, always take a, or make a quick assessment of what the standard deviation will equal. And here visually we're showing that this is the mean, 6, and the score that is closest to is either 5 or 7, and that deviates by 1 point. And the score that's furthest from 6 is the score of 1, and that deviates by 5 points. So we can make a quick assessment that we would expect standard deviation, deviation to fall somewhere in between, between standard deviation will be between the deviations of 5 and 1, somewhere between 5 and 1. So a good way to estimate this would just take the average of that deviation. So 5 plus 1 divided by 2 because we have two deviations, one that's closest and one that's furthest. So 6 divided by 2 and that gives us 3. So we can do a quick assessment and the calculation that you'll see in the text actually is equal to an exact deviation of 2.83. And so our estimate of 3 is pretty close. And the reason I point this out is because it's a good idea to estimate what you would anticipate the standard deviation to equal before you do the calculations. This will help you reconcile the computation of standard deviation to make sure you haven't made any mathematical errors along the way. Okay, so the population variance formula. Variance is equal to the sum of squared deviations, SS, over N number of scores. Again, this is all in relation to population, so the notation will um, coincide with what we expect for a population. So n is the size of a population. So again, SS, sum of squares, is the sum of square deviations of scores from the mean. And we just learned that SS is equal to um, sigma, right, sum, and then our deviations that are squared. So by definition, it's very easy to understand. SS, sum of squares, um, or the sum of squared deviations. So in, in the parentheses, we have deviation. Outside, we have the squaring of that deviation, and then the summation. The two formulas for compute, there are two formulas for computing SS. We refer to the two different formulas as the definitional and computational. The definitional is important to teach first because by definition, conceptually, you can understand and see this process of computing deviation scores, the sum of deviation scores, and then taking the average. So we begin, as I've indicated before, we find the deviation for each score, score minus the mean. We square each deviation, x minus mu squared, and then we sum up the squared deviation. So I just showed you this equation. Again, by definition, here we have the deviation. We square the deviation. And again, order of operation. Do what's in the parentheses first, exponents, and then the sigma or summation would be last. And then we sum. So by definition, this makes a lot of sense. The sum of squared deviations. Deviation squared, take the sum.
Now the computational formula is also presented in, and more readily used because it is time saving, but conceptually it's um, not as easy to understand and it's difficult when instructors only teach the computational formula because we lose sight of what variance and standard deviation actually represent. So the computational formula states that we square each score and sum the, um, the squared scores. So here we're starting with by order of operation, we would take our scores, take each score, and square it, and then take the summation. And then we find the sum of scores and square it, um, and that's here. This should look familiar. Where have we seen this before? The sum of x. The sum of x is needed when we calculate the mu. So sum of x, right, over n. So my recommendation is that normally we'll begin each distribution with calculating the mean. Once you calculate the sum of x, and if you're going to utilize the computational formula, I recommend that you put that immediately into the um, parentheses so that you don't confuse it with this value, the sum of x squared. What this is showing over here is if we were to consider a distribution of x values, so let's say 2 and 3 and, and um, 4, and we would square each of those scores, so 4, 9, and 16, and then we would take the sum of all those scores that have been squared, and that's what this is referring to. Very different from the sum of x that's been squared. This is taking each x value, squaring it, and taking summation. Um, and then once we get these, so we would divide um, by the population size, so just this is divided by this, and then whatever this value is equal to, it's subtracted from this value. So that last point says subtract the second part from the first to get um, the final value of the sum of squared deviations. I'll be demonstrating both equations um, with examples. Again, the computational formula is faster. It saves you one whole step per score, but the definitional formula helps you conceptualize what you are calculating and the definitions of SS, variance, and standard deviation are very evident when we use the definitional formula. And this um, a point of caution, SS does not equal any of these values. Again, if you're using the computational formula, SS is equal to the sum of all scores that have been squared minus the sum of scores that is squared divided by n. So um, there's a tendency to uh, for students to combine the equations. Um, again, this is the computational process. The definitional of SS, SS is equal to the sum of x minus mu squared. So sometimes students um, take pieces of one equation and merge it with the other um, and come up with some very creative um, responses for SS. Just recognize again, order of operation will assist you in ensuring that you come up with the correct answer all of the steps and recognize that again all of these um, things on the right um, of these equations are, are very different from one another and um, it's just a matter of reading the notation correctly so that um, it prevents you from making any mathematical mistakes. All right so this is a bit of a review so again the population variance the formula and notation so the formula for variance is the SS. SS stands for the sum of squared deviations over the population size. And um, the notation for variance for a population is Greek letter sigma squared. So lowercase Greek letter sigma squared, which is this little guy here. So when you see this, this refers to variance of a population. It's a parameter, right? It's a value coming from the population. Standard deviation is derived by taking the square root of variance. And notice that here in the square root, we've put SS over N. That's equivalent to variance. So you'll see this 
uh, written several different ways. We can, in the previous slide, I believe it said standard deviation is equal to the square root of variance. And now they've put the equation um, here that represents variance. We can also see, so again, the notation is lowercase Greek sigma, lower, lowercase Greek letter sigma is equal to, we can also see this, right? Because we know that variance, the notation is lowercase Greek letter sigma squared. And if we take the square root of that, that's going to give us standard deviation. So again, this is equal to standard deviation of a population. We have to keep all the notation um, separate and organized. And again, if you see either of these characters, you know you're working with population values. And the notation is slightly different for a sample, and we'll discuss that um, soon. And we'll conclude here with the learning check to make sure we um, were able to digest the information presented. So true or false, the computational and definitional formulas for SS, the so sum of square deviations, sometimes give different results. True or false? The answer is false. It, they are always going to give you the same answer. Um, it's just using a different mathematical procedure. Um, if you were to solve one problem using both calculations, the computational and definitional formulas, and you came up with different answers, that would indicate that somewhere along the line you made a mathematical error. In other words, the computational and definitional formulas for SS will always give you the exact same answer. And um, the next one, true or false, if all the scores in the data are the same. So let's consider this. Let's say all the quiz scores for chapter 3 are equal to 4. So everyone scored a 4. Okay, so all the scores and data are the same. The standard deviation would equal 1. Again, by definition, standard deviation indicates the average difference between the scores in the distribution and the mean. Well, what do you think the mean of this distribution would equal? If you said 4, you would be correct. So the mean would equal 4. And then if we want to express the average difference between each of these scores, each of these x values and the mean, would it be 1? And your answer should be no, it would be zero, that, that they do not deviate by any amount from the mean, right? 4 minus 4 is zero, so there's no deviation, and so the average deviation in this case would equal zero. So here, um, an, an extension of the answers I just gave, so the first one falls, the computation formula is just an algebraic re rearrangement of the definitional formula. The results are always going to be identical. And the second statement was also false. When all the scores are the same, they are all equal to the mean. Their deviation is equal to zero, and their standard deviation would also equal zero. Again, by definition, standard deviation is the average difference between the scores in the distribution and the mean of the distribution. So if they don't deviate at all, then the standard deviation would also reflect that in equal zero. And finally, the standard deviation measures one of these. So is it the sum of squared deviations? the standard distance of a score from the mean, the average deviation of scores from the mean, or the average squared distance of a, uh, of a score from the mean. So again, is it the sum of, score of squared deviation scores? That represents SS. The standard distance of a score from the mean, the average deviation of a score from the mean, the average squared distance from the mean, this, because it says squared distance, we know is variance. So let's consider the other two. And both of these would be considered correct. Um, the standard, again, I said you can replace the word standard with average. Distance can also be replaced with the word deviation. So it's they're both expressing an average distance or deviation from the mean of the distribution. So B and C would be correct in this case. And that concludes part one of chapter four, Measures of Variability.